don't worry, uh, most of the time I will actually spend uh, in, in the demo itself, uh, if I have appeased the, the demo gods enough, but um, just to give you a bit of motivation and, and you know, background uh, why I started that and why I think it's a good idea. So let's start with a show of hands. Who of you considers yourself being more on the infrastructure side, so provisioning stuff and... Okay. And who of you is more on the developing side, writing applications? Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, the motivation. Why, why was I motivated to do that? Um, I think it's, it's all about app ops. So that's the person who not only develops an application, but really then is also responsible for putting that application uh, on a cluster, running it, and operating it 24-7, including uh, any kind of serv service level uh, objectives. And uh, as you can see here, um, it's sometimes really this feeling like, yeah, I've, I've deployed it, right? But then uh, there comes this uh, typically longer cycle of actually operating that and uh, dealing with all kinds of things. I just also want to make sure that we understand that AppOps is really about the application itself, putting that application into the operation, and not about the, the stuff like you know, provisioning a VM, uh, installing, for example, a Kubernetes cluster, or replacing faulty hard disk drives. Right? Uh, obviously, that also needs to be done, but I see here a natural way of uh, you know, splitting the uh, responsibilities here. OK, so why do I bother? Why uh, did I bother in the first place? I deeply care about app ops, so I somehow now silently uh, introduced this term. Actually, I, I got it from someone else, um, trying to establish that or, or help uh, blossom uh, that this term uh, gets a bit more attention because I believe that DevOps, that's, that's the overarching, you know, the paradigm behind it, but a certain person, um, you know, I wouldn't call myself a DevOps, but I, I would call myself an AppOps. Um, I had the feeling when starting out with uh, Kubernetes that kubectl feels a bit low level. Um, we had earlier on uh, that discussion um, with uh, uh, or, or the talk from, from Puppet Labs, um, and I think there was a similar feeling about that for application developers, for app ops, um, kubectl can be a bit, uh, yeah, not, not matching with, with the expectations. I really wanted an application-centric uh, workflow. And last but not least, um, you know, even in a microservices setup, um, one service typically is not only a, s a single person working on that, but you have two or three other colleagues. So you probably want to share something. You want to collaborate with others in order to get your application or service uh, actually deployed. OK, so most of the stuff that I'm going to show you here um, actually came out after I started working on Kploy. Um, but you know, obviously, you can use kubectl, uh, have some shell scripts around that, or directly uh, use the uh, API. Uh, there's the Helm project by Ace. Um, they uh, strive to be the kind of missing package manager of Kubernetes. Uh, there's Red Spread uh, quite recently. Um, Puppet we have that uh, seen earlier on. Uh, and there's this new project called KTemplate, uh, essentially parameterized uh, manifests there. And there are plenty of others I'm pretty sure that I'm not aware of. And please, if you know uh, of one of or, or probably have done it yourself, uh, let me know. Always happy to see what else is going on there. Just to, to make the point, uh, Kploy is certainly in its vision or in the idea uh, not alone. And as I said, uh, since I started working on that, uh, many, many more um, have uh, come up. So let's uh, have a look at Kploy, what, uh, what it really is. The design principles, uh, it's a bit of a, a big word, but uh, the, the things that, that uh, motivated and, and drove me uh, are certainly convention over configuration. Um, people might uh, not appreciate always uh, Ruby on Rails, but I, I believe that this conf convention over configuration has certain advantages. I really wanted to make it very easy for app ops uh, to get started. Um, and I agree uh, with uh, the speaker from Puppet Lab that uh, you should not abstract you know, too much away. People should be aware of what's going on, um, but there are certain point of views that uh, you would probably prefer uh, in your workflow. 
And one of the things that, uh, to me at least, was very important, especially if you start with something, you want to know what's going on. And I uh, highlighted this explain here, and you will see later on what it means, um, that in each and every step, you should have a detailed explanation of what is going on and what are your further options. <coughs> so Kplyr really is application-centric, it's manifest-based, and it's uh, largely stateless. I will come in future work to, you know, there are certain ideas of, of uh, yeah, especially sharing uh, these apps, um, but essentially think of it, you would need some uh, manifests, uh, be it for replication controllers or services, um, and Kplyr is working off of these. So what does the layout look like? Essentially, you have a file that's called Kplyr file that defines uh, the application. Then you have a bunch of um, directories, RCS, where the replication controllers would uh, live, uh, services where obviously the services would live, and an optional directory, uh, env, where things like uh, secrets, credentials, and so on would live. And the Kplyr file itself, very, very simple YAML file. You need to provide the uh, API server, so uh, the Kubernetes entry point, if you want. Uh, you provide the, the author tag. Um, the cache remote is for uh, external resources. I'm going to talk to that uh, in the future part. Uh, the name of the, the application, which namespace it should um, live in, and the source, which again is a kind of, uh, yeah, tag or, or way uh, how you can uniquely identify your project. And again, that's mainly relevant if you want to uh, share that. Okay, now time for a demo. And just to give you an idea what you will see in the next couple of minutes, um, we're going to create an app from scratch, launch the app, monitor the app, and tear it down again. And that's the comprehensive state diagram of what you will see. So in it, try, run, run list stats and then destroy and then some advanced usages handling credentials scaling the app debugging it and exporting it and now fingers crossed can you see that all right is that big enough yeah cool and of course i have my cheat sheet so let's install kploy probably should mention that I have a cluster here, obviously, uh, with four nodes already running. So Kplyr uh, assumes that you have a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster somewhere already running, right? That's uh, outside of, of uh, what Kplyr can do for you. Activating that, and since Kplyr currently is written in uh, Python, I know I'm not one of the cool kids who does Go um, yet. Um, and now we should have Kplyr here, right? Yeah, okay. So now it's installed and we can uh, actually start. So the first step, just to show, you know, there's nothing here, nothing to see beside the virtual env. Uh, let's do a Kplyr init. And Kplyr will confirm that you know it has done its work, has set up this uh, structure, and uh, if we look in the Kplyr file, well, that's the, the default there. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, yeah, <laughs> Python and Nano. I'm I'm really sorry. I'm going to edit this Kplyr file with uh, the specifics here. So I need to provide, as I said, where is the API server, um, author, and uh, I just used the uh, you know non non-existing GitHub repository here. Um, but typically, you should you would expect that you tag it the source with uh, where it actually lives uh, on a yeah repo. Okay, so everything there, and just to make sure to see if that there is actually the endpoint there. Yay, endpoint is there. Okay, that was just a test to see if everything uh, works. Okay, so now that's essentially everything that um, that Kplyr needs, but we still don't have uh, anything there. Uh, we, we've just set up the application as such, or the connection to the Kubernetes cluster. So if I do a dry run now, uh, it will check if, if it can connect to the cluster, that's fine. I have apparently four nodes uh, that it has found, but I hasn't, uh, hasn't found any 
um, resource manifests or service man manifests yet. So I'm going to um, copy some prepared um, things. So the replication controller and the web the services definition in here. And if I do dry run now again, it should actually tell me, yeah, OK, found one uh, replication control and one services manifest. OK. So now I can actually um, run that application. And by that, I mean that it actually goes out and deploys, Kiplan goes out and uh, deploys um, all the things that are necessary. So it takes a bit. Um, totally agree with um, Kelsey there, as he said in his uh, keynote, no uh, Kubernetes demo without Nginx. Um, Okay, that went fine, and now we can actually have a, a look at the resources there. So we see that uh, Kploy has, you know, it took that uh, services manifest and took that uh, resource controller, and uh, it's online. It's it's uh, you know available in the cluster. And if I look here, I should actually see. the API output, yes, it's there. And um, if I go to proxy, I should actually also see the output, right? Yeah. OK, so everything is fine. Everything is running. Now, stats gives you a different view on, on your application. Um, here, that's a bit of a a more low-level point of view, and I would argue that especially for debugging, and that's what I mean with not totally hiding the, the things that are going on under. So this list, again, as a, as a uh, comparison, here it's really talking about uh, the services and the uh, uh, replication controllers and secrets and, and whatnot as such. And with uh, stats, it's really about the underlying things, so uh, what pods are running uh, and what n nodes are in, in use. And most of the information here that, that you can see here is uh, I selected that because that's what I found that, that I'm mostly interested in when uh, developing and testing and deploying an application. OK, so we have done uh, that. And now I'm coming back to the explain part. So. You have already realized that pretty much in every step, let's do dry run again, for example. Um, Kploy will tell you in the last line, OK, here are your next options, right? You have done dry run. Now you can actually run it. In addition to that, you can um, actually say explain for every um, of the commands. So. You can actually understand uh, what is going on um, and what the impact will be. And that is exactly um, what I mean by making it easy for people that start. There are quite a number of, of you know, new concepts and uh, things that you need to be aware of in, in Kubernetes. And having given that explicit information at the time where people do something with it, uh, helps, I believe, a lot to you know uh, understand and, and get get better faster. Okay, so that's the the kind of basic uh, usage we have created a application from scratch, and as I said, Kiploy depends on these manifests. Um, and one nice way, and that's um, one feature that Kiploy has um, via indirect uh, references, you can pull uh, the manifests also from Helm. So if you provide um, a uh, URI, and that's actually quite nicely documented here as well. Um, then you can actually pull from um, directly from from the Helm projects. It's uh, a rather shallow integration for now, um, but if I see that that is something people actually want and, and use, I'm uh, more than happy to invest more time into that integration. Uh, but without manifests, as I said. Um, Kiploy is essentially useless, right? So you need manifests somewhere. OK, so the normal um, workflow would now be, OK, I've done everything. 
I uh, destroy that application and Kepler goes out and, and deletes all the, the resources that were attached with that uh, application. If I now say list, I would still say see uh, the resources that I have locally, uh, but it tells me the status that it's offline um, and stats should actually show nothing in usage, right? There shouldn't be any, any pods running now. Okay, now let's uh, run it again because now we're um, interested in some other things. So one of the things that uh, Kubernetes does really well, I believe, is uh, handling of uh, secrets. So any kind of you know credentials, API keys, passwords, or whatever has a very very um, you know complete and useful model there. The handling of the secrets not always or not entirely. I know that Kelsey has done some great work around that and um, Kepler also uh, considers these secrets as first class citizens. So let's assume that uh, we will uh, we have a database for example and we want to provide um, a secret that has the super secret password. So what I would do is I, I would create this as I said optional uh, environment or env uh, directory and I would have the super secret password as um, as a file, right? So if I then, oops, ah, uh, that was not clever of me. Ha! <laughs> you know that feeling when you create something and you change it in the last second? So that was really stupid. The reason being is, um, and here is where convention over configuration <laughs> sometimes sucks, um, that I called the virtual env env and Kepler also uses env, so that's not cool, but okay, nevertheless. Um, we just create it manually and ignore the fact that um, that env actually in our context is a um, okay. So in here it's just that one uh, yeah, secret that you want to have. And now, I first have to destroy that because I was too fast. So now I essentially, when I say run, uh, I want to have this secret available for, for example, for a database. And now if I say run, the secret should uh, actually be picked up uh, from that end of directory and um, made available in the application, hopefully. Okay, let's see, okay, everything is running, and now with list I should also see um, the secret there. I take it that that might not be uh, a desired thing, right, that you actually see a password in the clear. Um, Sometimes it's useful for debugging, so um, I take it th there is some work to be done in, in that uh, space. Um, then there is obviously the question of scaling, so scaling the app. Um, as we know in Kubernetes, that's just a matter of um, setting the, the replication controller right. And in our case, um, it looks pretty similar to, um, to Kubernetes kubectl itself, so again as a um, comparison right now we have three uh, pods running there and uh, once I say scale that uh, back to one it should um, only have one available, right? Yeah. Now let's scale that up to two because I need it later for debugging and if I only have one that's probably not so fun. Okay, so sometimes it's the case that um, one of your, you know, parts is behaving weirdly or a container in one of the parts is behaving weirdly and you would not necessarily in this container context uh, trying to fix something there. You would just take it offline, uh, do, do a post-mortem there and then learn from that and, and probably uh, release a new version. And to do that, you, again, that's something that uh, I thought is useful uh, for app ops to have you would essentially say, um, I want to um, debug a certain, um, well I first need to 
see which one I take. Let's say the first one here. I see there's something behaving weirdly with that first uh, part. So I'm taking this one here. Okay. So it removes it from the replication controller. And when I now say stats, I should actually see a new um, a new pod instead of the one I just took offline. And now I have this <laughs> offline. It's not connected to any re replication controller anymore. And I can, you know, SSH into that, have a look around why does that one pod uh, behave weirdly and so on. Okay, how are we doing with the time? I think we're still still good, right? Can do one more thing. So as I said, the um, the basic idea, let's just have a look again, is that it's stateless in the sense that it doesn't really store anything in you know some external database or whatever. Everything that Kplo needs is is actually in uh, in uh, the directory here. But sometimes you want to you know share that. Uh, you could either say, okay, I want to you know commit something back to um, uh, to a GitHub repository in a in a yeah more compressed way or whatever, or you want to share it in some other way uh, to boot bootstrap it from somewhere else. And in order to do that, you essentially just say um, kplo export. So let's say you're not sure. OK, what it does is it creates an archive um, of all the relevant uh, files that uh, kplo needs. So if we say export here, there should be um, a file called app.kploy. And if we look at that, it's really just um, a zip file, right? So if I change that to zip and look into that, that's really just a zip file of, of all the relevant uh, yeah, directories and so on. And that's the thing that you could then uh, you know, share with others, or um, you might want to version that and, and commit it or whatever. Um, it's just the idea of you know, bundling up all the uh, relevant resources for Kploy and um, making that available. And on top of that, um, that's one of the things I'm working on is essentially a kind of pull and push so that you can essentially share these uh, archives with, with others. Um, but that's still a bit experimental, so I'm not going to demo that now. OK. Any questions so far? So the future. Now, as I said already, um, this pull and push, um, the current implementation essentially just uses um, some uh, uh, Google storage to uh, create uh, the, uh, yeah, to, to share that archive and, and there the, the source uh, URL is essentially used to tag that. Uh, so you can essentially um, share that with others, but it's, I would say, not that useful without authentication. Um, so that's why I call it experimental. Um, I'm certainly interested in more integration points, uh, especially the advanced Helm integration, because I believe that in, in order to bootstrap, you want to have some kind of templates or whatever there that you then start to customize and you know, getting to a fully functional application or, or microservices uh, faster. And I would be interested in uh, what would you like to see? So you know, either you tell me now or uh, raise an issue there or uh, you know, send in a pull request. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to share regarding Kploy and just to point out some community resources, some nice books, and last but not least, the uh, community resource where we're trying to collect uh, you know, this and other relevant uh, resources. And again, same, same here. It's uh, up on GitHub, so pull requests are welcome. OK. Yeah. Then I'm opening up for questions. <coughs> Any questions, anyone? No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That gentleman cannot ask a question. I'm sorry, Adrian. <laughs> I was just wondering, so is the main installation thing to, to run it from Python and pip? Yeah. I was just wondering, could you actually run it in a Docker container, and then I wouldn't have to worry about downloading and installing the right version of Python? And right, or in a Rocket container. I, just, I also hate virtual end. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, yeah, absolutely. So to me, you know, I've seen a few people using it, and, um, you know, uh, there I, I, I started out with, with Python because I, I, I 
that's where I'm most productive. Uh, my initial attempt was now to say, okay, rewriting it in Go, but this is certainly something. Yeah, I'm not knocking Python at all. I like Python, mm. but um, it just makes it easier for users, or you know, and like say, you go listen to the Python two versus Python three problems. So yes. I actually always use Python and Docker containers now. Yes, yes. So yeah, absolutely valid. Um, as I said, to me, it's in its current state, uh, kind of MVP to see is there something, is that useful for people? And the the usefulness is not necessarily by you know shouting my face, yes, Michael, or no, Michael. It's by people using it <laughs> or app using it, and from that we can learn. Uh, th the main point for me is really this this uh, app ops idea and, and understanding in the context of containers and, and microservices, what kind of workflows are useful for people, what needs to change from the traditional way. And if you've noticed one thing, I don't really cover the CICD pipeline or whatever anywhere here. So this is really intentionally kept very, very simple um, to really cover that part, to introduce an application centric point of view to that part um, and and I think it, it, it lives and dies with all the integration to all the other things as I said Helm being uh, one example and you know the CCD pipeline being another um, but I believe if not Kploy itself but something like that <laughs> probably Kploy done right <laughs> is something that people want and need any more questions at all okay Stuff in silence oh one more yep yeah, more so, are there any uh, any thoughts about having something like Kploy becoming a module for orchestration tools like Ansible, for example? Sorry, I didn't catch the last part. Uh, a module. So, uh, can can there be in the future a module for Ansible for Kploy, for example? Because one of the things that in my mind is quite delicate around Kubernetes is the secret stuff handling. Mm -hmm. And one of the advantages in using Ansible is the fact that you can have a vaulted file with secret stuff in there, which is encrypted and everything. And uh, and there's the handling of secret stuff through an Ansible playbook, which can eliminate that sensitivity around having like in the clear files with secret stuff in it. Right. Can there be a module for Kploy to use Kploy within an Ansible playbook, for example? Rather Absolutely. than having uh, to run shell right. shell commands right. because it, it looks pretty interesting to be honest. Right. right. So thank you and, and yes. Uh, so the thing is, as I said, I put it out there because I needed it myself uh, and and using it myself. Um, I'm not an Ansible expert. I would probably be not in the position to write it myself. But uh, yeah, as I said, I, I had other people, you know, sending in pull requests to. Uh, uh, make some things more more pretty and useful than than I did it, um, and uh, I'm certainly open, right? I'm I think there is a certain overlap, so it's it's then a question to what extent you know what kind of abstraction are you using, and and uh, if there are too many overlaps, then you might <laughs> you might be using too many tools at once. But I would certainly be be open, uh, and, and and you know if anyone has the interest to do that, then yeah, <laughs> get in touch, please. Yes. Okay. No more. Final call. Yeah, something yeah. So what are you running on it at the minute? Is it just like pet projects or Sorry? What, what are you using K Play for yourself? Um so there are a couple of um it's it's partially demos, so there's there's nothing that I have, you know, something that is in production in the sense of that uh, I'm losing money if it's not online. Um, but it's it's yeah it's demos it's proof of concepts it's that kind of thing that um, yeah where it's just faster for me to to use it that way um, but yeah as I said I think if you start in that space and and you are perfectly happy with the you know abstraction layer that Cube Control Cube CTL gives you then you're fine if not then <laughs> maybe that or something like that is the answer yeah okay. Yeah. More question here. So you were talking about app ops. Yeah. Which sounds quite interesting. Um, would you consider continuous delivery to be a part of that? Sort of moving yeah. your apps through different environments to production? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. The entire from you know laptop here, I'm starting, I don't know, coding in Scala, whatever, the entire C A C D pipeline and you know, 
keeping it in production, keeping it alive. You're the one who is, um, you know, paged and so on and so forth in the context of your application. But would you will uh, K de K ploy um, sort of get the concept of multiple passes and promotion? It currently doesn't. So currently, I made this decision uh, very intentionally to have that out of scope to just say, okay, you have y you get the manifest from somewhere. You have it somewhere, and you want to deploy it and run it. So I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm not covering the entire space of what an apps op app ops has has to to uh, you know take care of in, in, in my idea. Um, but that's why I said the CI/CD pipeline integration or whatever um, Jenkins or whatever um, that that's certainly something. Again, I would see it uh, quite similar with the Helm integration. It would be an integration point, not necessarily something that I, I would want to do in, in Kploy itself. Mm -hmm. So it would leverage something like like Jenkins. Yeah, but absolutely. So that's to me that's vital to you know make sure that uh, people actually deploy and and uh, are responsible for their things, uh, especially in the in the context of microservices, where that's probably more suitable and and <laughs> realistic than in a big monolith. Okay. On the note, <coughs> excuse me. I know you did a great talk, Michael. At Container Scared last year, didn't you? So if you're looking at some of the more details behind, like sort of the life cycle of applications mm -hmm. and maintaining them, yeah. um, post deployment, check out uh, on the Skills Matter website a video by Michael uh, where he's talking a lot more in depth about that, and I totally recommend mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Uh, any more questions at all? Okay. In that case, join me one last time. Thank you, Michael, once again. Thank you.